Scripture reading this evening is found in Psalm 51. Psalm 51 begins this way. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Yet you desired faithfulness, even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in that secret place. Cleanse me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways so that sinners will turn back to you Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, you who are God my Savior, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. Open my lips, Lord, and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. God will not despise. May it please you to prosper Zion, to build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in the sacrifices of the righteous, in burnt offerings offered whole. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. Thanks, Bruce, for leading us in music and leading us in prayer. really appreciate that. Keep your Bibles open to Psalm 51 if you have them there. If you don't, get them there, because we're going to be jumping back and forth uh, in Psalm 51 tonight. Jesus taught us what to pray, and the Psalms show us how to pray. And in a way, the Psalms show us how to pray the Lord's Prayer, as we've been looking at week after week. Tonight we're at this uh, fourth line of the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. When someone wrongs you, have you ever said, you owe me? That's kind of the sense here. Forgive us our debts. The word debt can be used in two different ways. It can refer to moral, uh, uh, financial debt or it can refer to, refer to moral debt. So when uh, Luke writes the Lord's Prayer, he uses the word sin. But when Matthew writes the Lord's Prayer, he uses the word debt because they both mean Uh, the same thing. Moral debt that we all have before God. Now at Forestdale Church, we just hired a new bookkeeper. Her name is Cindy. And I was helping her get settled in the office, and she said, I have a key to the front door. I don't think I have a key to my office, though. So I looked at her keys, and I grabbed one, and I put it in the door, and I jiggled it a little bit and opened the door. She had the right key. She just I uh, wasn't using it the right way, or maybe the key's just kind of worn out, and I know the tricks. But when it comes to confession of sin, it's just like that. I think we all know we have it. We all know we ought to do this. But sometimes we don't do it the right way. Sometimes it doesn't seem like our confession of sin is really working. Sometimes the problem is we're not going into confession the way we ought to. Other times, we're not coming out of confession the way we ought to. But when we learn a thing or two about who God is and what God has done, it totally reshapes how we confess our sin. It totally reshapes how we pray, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. So we're looking at Psalm 51. 
And we're asking the question, how should the character of God reshape what we believe about sin and how we confess it? Well, let's jump right into verse 4. Verse 4, David says, Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So, or therefore, you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Now, the uh, postscript to Psalm 51 you'll read there is about David sinning against Bathsheba in, the, uh, in adultery, but then in the murder of her husband, Uriah. So we know David's sin he's responding to in Psalm 51. He's sinned against so many people in what he's done. And yet, he says... There's really only one person I've sinned against, and it's God. What's going on here? Why does David say this? Well, first, David is not denying that he has sinned against an individual, another person. Because look down at verse 14. He says, deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed. So he's getting specific. He's confessing his sin of murder. He's absolutely aware of that sin. But the distinction is that sin before God is primary and fundamental before all other sin. Suppose a father gave his son a puppy as a gift that the son has been begging for. The son receives this puppy but neglects to feed it, neglects to clean the puppy, neglects to bring the puppy outside to get sunlight. What sin that this son has committed against this dog, this animal, for neglect. And yet the son's sin is doubly wicked because it is a sin at the same time for neglecting and spurning the good gift that his father has given him. All sin that we commit, whether it's sin that we commit against another person, sin you could commit against your dog or whatever, it flows downstream from a primary sin, rebellion against God, This is why R.C. Sproul defines sin as cosmic treason. How so? Well, because God is the one who made us. And everything we have is a good gift from him. Psalm 100 verse 3. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us and we are his. The Apostle Paul writes in Acts 17, The God who made the world and everything in it is Lord of heaven and earth. He's not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything. So who have we sinned against? All our sin, all our sin is against God. Now, The first line of Psalm 51 is, Uh, sets this prayer of confession in its context, as I've mentioned. Nathan the prophet approached David the king to confront him about his sin by telling him a parable. He said that there once were two men in a certain town. One man was really rich. One man was really poor. The rich man had large amounts of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except for one precious lamb that he bought and he raised this precious lamb with his children it would eat at his table and drink from his own cup and fall asleep in his arm it was like a daughter to this poor man now a traveler came to visit the rich man but rather than using one of his sheep to prepare the table for his guest he goes and takes the one sheep from the poor man for his guest Now, David, listening to this parable, doesn't know it's a parable. He thinks it's real. And he gets enraged within himself, seeing this wickedness and evil. And he says, as surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this must die. He must pay for that lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. Then Nathan the prophet said to David, you're the man. You are that man. You and I are confronted by sin every day. We see sin on the news. We see sin in books we read. We see sin in in our families. Perhaps the worst thing that bothers us is when when we see sin run free. The bad guy gets away. 
either he's, he slips the grasp of justice or no one ever finds out that it was really him. But God, our maker and just judge, tells us about these deeds of injustice as a parable. And he says, you're the man. You're the woman. You are the one who has done such things before me. And when we acknowledge God as our creator and judge, who is righteous and just, as David says, our sinfulness and need for grace becomes so clear. This is what David means in verse 3 when he says, My sin is always before me. Another English translation embellishes uh, this verse a little bit, but I think they get it exactly right. Uh, It says, My sin haunts me day and night. Like a pebble that's dropped in a pond, uh, ripples. Sin has consequences. And, And perhaps one of the worst consequences of our sin is just the memory of our sin. The guilt that we bear, remembering what we have done. Maybe it was an unkind word you said. Or a moment uh, of anger that just came out of you. Something you stole. A moment of weakness that was exposed. At first glance, we uh, might quickly deny the notion that we're sinners, but our own memory betrays us. Guilt and shame as we carry it, will only burden us more and more as life goes on. And if you don't do anything about it, it'll make you a bitter person whose cloud of darkness everyone can sense around you. And so sometimes we could seek forgiveness and actually not receive forgiveness. People may not want to forgive you for the things you've done. What do you do? Well, since all our sin is ultimately against God... We can find freedom from guilt through forgiveness from God, who is our ultimate judge, who stands above all other sin, despite all the other people or other things we've sinned against. So we can be set free even from the greatest of guilt because we can receive ultimate forgiveness from every one of our sins because all of our sins are ultimately against God though our sin may ever be before us, we can ask David this bold request that he says in verse 9, God, hide your face from my sins. My sins are always before me, but would you pretend like you can't see them? And the Lord answers in Jeremiah 31 that when we repent, he will remember our sin no more. Now, all this time I've been speaking about sin as things that we do. But we only do sin because we are sinful. Sin is a condition of our being. Our habit of sin demonstrates that we ourselves are a habitat for sin. Look again at what David says in verse 5. He says, surely I was sinful at birth. Sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Now David is not saying... That as an infant in the womb, he was already plotting in advance how he would steal toys from other children or hide sweets in his bedroom. That's not what he's saying. He's referring to his fallen condition as a human being, something that we all share living downstream from Adam's fall. It's often referred to as original sin, this term. But it doesn't refer to Adam's first sin, but rather the condition of sinfulness. That is passed on to all humanity through Adam's cursed condition. So it's as if being Adam's children, we receive the estate as an inheritance of his sinfulness, his sinful condition. Romans 5, 12. Sin entered the world through one man and death through sin. And in this way, death came to all people because all sinned. Ephesians 2. We are by nature, not by choice, by nature, children of wrath. And why why does Paul use the word children here? Well, because children are born and all are born in sin, as David says. Birds fly, fish swim, bears crawl. You sin. I sin. It's our nature to do so. Having been born in this condition of fallenness that we've inherited through Adam and Eve. And this is proven in that sin affects 
every part of our being. Sin affects every part of our being. It goes far beyond the fact that we do evil deeds. It affects even the good deeds you do, doesn't it? We can pursue so many good deeds with the wrong motives. For example, have you ever worked really hard at something that you were responsible to do, which is the right thing to do, right? You're supposed to work really hard. But you're only doing it because you want it to look good in front of other people. You may have been complimented by your dedication and work ethic, all the while just being driven by greed or pride the whole time. Like a child who cleans her room, does all her homework early, and announces her good deeds to everyone in the house because it makes her feel better about herself when she sees how disappointed her parents are with her siblings who can never live up to such a standard. Even the good things done with the wrong motives is sin. One of the earliest Protestant confessions from the 16th century describes it like this, that our sinful condition in Adam is like a contaminated fountain from which all other sin flows out. So how can we be cured from this? Well, just as there are particular medicines for particular diseases, so there is a particular kind of redemption for us who are born in sin. So David says in verse 10 to God, Create in me a pure heart, O God. Renew a steadfast spirit within me and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. So often when we come to God to confess our sin, being ridden with guilt, we we might plead to him, Oh, please forgive me. I promise I'll change. But David knows better than to talk to God like that. So he says, God, I need you to change me. I need to be forgiven for what I've done, but I need to be uh, redeemed for who I am. One Old Testament scholar points out that this word create in the Old Testament is only ever used with God as its subject. He's saying this is something only God does. The most famous example of this creative work of God is when he brings the world into existence, Genesis 1. So David asked God, create in me a clean heart. Just as God spoke the world into existence, he speaks new spiritual life into existence for those who come to him for mercy in faith and repentance. Listen to how the Lord describes it to the prophet Ezekiel. He says, I will give my people a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. Well, since sin is our nature and affects every part of our being, God redeems us by making us new creations. So you see, you could be asking God to forgive you for the wrong reasons. You could say, if you forgive me, I promise I'll change. But God replies, I'm happy to forgive you, but just not for the reasons you've asked. I know how far you'll get if we go down that road. I'm not going to cleanse you because of your promise to change, but because of my promise to change you. We are like the people who approach Jesus and ask, what must I do to be saved? We want to know techniques and strategies because we think behavior modification is the answer. Yes, our sinful behavior is is a cause of our guilt. But our sinful behavior is merely a result of our sinful condition. Therefore, behavior modification cannot serve as a means of getting right with God. Our very nature must be changed. And this is precisely the type of change that the Lord brings through Jesus Christ. So we can go back to Ephesians chapter 2. The apostle Paul writes that we were dead in our trespasses and sins as a metaphor here. Being by nature a a child of wrath, as we've read, But he says, but God raises us to new life, to spiritual life in Christ. By grace, we have been saved. 
And God has done this through the Holy Spirit, as Jesus will talk about in John chapter 3. You must be born again, born of the Spirit. And this was the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, that raises us to spiritual life. Which is why it is said that all who are in Christ are what? A new creation. Yet, I don't know about you, we continue to struggle in sin even after that, don't we? Why? Because God's work of new creation in us is not, has begun, but it has not been yet complete. And in fact, and, and it won't be complete until we die and are raised to new life, incorruptible with the same resurrection that Jesus had. So then, for those who are in Christ, for those who have been made new by the Holy Spirit, how should we now think about our continual, perhaps daily, confession of sin? Because we're not being resurrected to spiritual life every time we confess our sin. But when we confess our sin, we are cleansed as with a shower of spiritual refreshment in anticipation of the final resurrection we will experience in Christ. Being raised incorruptible and incapable of sinning. So every time you, can, you come to confess your sin to God, anticipate this final resurrection well you will sin no more but on the on the flip side of this coin if you're not a christian this should sell, tell you something too it's all well and good that you enjoy church but if you just want to add something good to your life so that god might um, buff out your rough edges let me just be straight with you You've got the wrong idea about what God is about to do with you. This God is not interested in helping you be your best version of yourself. He's here to tear down your life, to tear it all down, and to rebuild it from the ground up into a new creation. C.S. Lewis writes in Mere Christianity that God is building quite a different house from the one you thought of. He's throwing out a new wing here, He's putting an extra floor there, running up towers, making courtyards. You thought you were being made into a nice little cottage, but he's building a palace because he's coming to live in it himself. It's actually good news. So let me summarize what we've covered so far and answer our main question. How does this reshape how we pray forgive us our debts? We know because God offers unfailing love and compassion we can freely, freely confess our sin to be freed from our guilt and made new in Christ. So you, you've now got the keys to the office, but how do you use them? Has it ever seemed to you that confessing sin isn't working? Have you ever not really felt any bit different after confessing sin? Perhaps you're not um, coming out of confession any different because you haven't gone into confession the right way. So here's a question. What should we bring in confession? What should we bring with us when we go to God in prayer for confession of sin? Well, when reading this last section of Psalm 51, uh, verses 16 to 19, David talks about offering to God an animal sacrifice and it seems as when we're reading verse 16 that offering a sacrifice is something that we should not do. He writes in verse 16, God, you do not delight in sacrifices or else I would bring them. Then he says, rather than bring, bringing a sacrifice, I'm going to bring you a broken and repentant heart. Yet look at verse 19. He says, and then you will delight in sacrifices. So, it's not that God only delights in a repentant heart and he doesn't delight in sacrifices, but that he delights in both when they're in the right order. Parents, you, I mean, you feel the same way when your children come to you. Wouldn't you rather they do good things because their heart is in the right place than that they simply do good things as a means to win your favor, regardless of how they really feel inside? So how does this apply to us today? Well, first we need to know that God no longer requires animal sacrifices from his people. 
Since Christ has come and fulfilled the pattern of, that the animal sacrifices uh, were setting up once and for all as the true sacrifice to atone for the sins of his people, we no longer offer up animal sacrifices, but rather are instructed to look to Christ, the true sacrifice, in faith. Receiving the atonement that he offered on the cross as payment for our sin debts. Yet, we are still called to respond to God's grace with obedience. For example, Romans 12, verse 1. Paul writes, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercies, in other words, in light of Christ's atoning sacrifice on the cross, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. So our sacrifice, if you will, becomes good works, obeying God's law, the Ten Commandments, by loving God and loving your neighbor. But we are prone all the same, just like the Israelites, to, to get it all mixed up. David wisely avoids this mistake in Psalm 51. If David were to bring an animal sacrifice in an attempt to appease God and get back in his good graces, the Lord may respond to him like, with something like this. <clears throat> we read this in Psalm 50. Why are you bringing me these animals as if I was short a bull or a goat? I own the cattle on a thousand hills. Every animal is mine. Why are you bringing me these animals as if I needed them? If I were hungry, I wouldn't tell you. Read that exchange in Psalm 50 sometime. Here's the point. When you confess your sin to God, bring nothing except your sin. Here's what I mean by that. Don't add an addendum of good behavior as if you'll get some time off. God has received the sacrifice of Christ who is perfectly righteous and holy. Therefore, God does not need your good works. Do not create for yourself a system of penance, attempting to pay God back for what you've done before you feel like you can be restored in his good grace. Just as God does not need an animal from David, God does not need your good works. As the Apostle Paul writes in Romans 11, if God's work of salvation comes about by grace, then it cannot be based on works. Those two are opposed. It's either grace or it's works. If it were based on works, he writes, then grace would no longer be grace. That's the point. It's like someone wanting to pay for all the birthday presents that people bring to their party. Don't, no, don't do that. You'll ruin everything. You'll ruin the party. You'll ruin why we gathered. Making all of these gifts just simply another thing you bought. Because God delights in grace. We can and must bring nothing with us but our sin. I mean, how else could David call God's love unfailing? Unfailing. God's love is unfailing for us because his love for us is not based on our obedience, but based on the perfectly obedient life and sacrificial death of Jesus Christ, his son. Therefore, for however holy and righteous Jesus is, so is the Lord's unfailing love for those who are his. This is why we bring nothing but our sin so that Christ can be our righteousness. If you want Christ to be your righteousness, you cannot bring any of your own. You have to leave it all there. Bring only your sin in this exchange. So we've now seen the mirror opposite of Adam's sin. It is Christ's righteousness. If our sinful condition because of Adam is like a contaminated fountain from which all our sin flows, then our righteousness in Christ is a purified fountain from which all our good works flow. We don't work now to get rest. We actually work out of the rest that we've been given in Christ. This is the only proper place for our good works as Christians. Good works are valid. They are necessary and good but only after grace, as a result of grace, and in gratitude for grace. So let me say that again. 
the only proper place for your good works before God is after grace, as a result of grace, and in gratitude for grace. So then, how should this shape us or reshape us when we pray as we forgive our debtors? Answer, by making us joy-filled givers of grace. Did you notice in Psalm 51, how much joy is at stake here? If we don't get this right, how much joy is at stake? David is saying, well, because of my sin, I am filled with sorrow. Verse 8, so let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have crushed rejoice. For verse 12, Re- restore to me the joy of of your salvation and grant to me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your way so that sinners will turn back to you. Deliver me and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. Open my lips, Lord, and my mouth will declare your praise. One of the things, maybe the the top thing that I love most about both living in Barbados and living in Cape Town, South Africa, was the exchange rate. It was as if the American dollar was worth double there, but everything else was just as nice. I felt like a king. I ate out all the time. And I, and I willingly, joyfully paid for all my friends. It was a good year. I thought, what do I care? I'm still getting paid the same but I'm in a completely different economy now. The grace of God in Christ brings us into a completely different economy such that for those who are truly changed by God's grace, they look to those around them and say, what do I care? I've been forgiven so much. And when compared to this, it is such a little thing. I'm getting paid the same, but now in Christ, I'm living in a completely different economy. When we've received and experienced the grace of God for us in Christ, we become joy-filled givers of grace. God's grace is glorified in us when we forgive others as he has forgiven us. If we have received this grace, how can we not give it to others? Whose debt is just a, it's not even a fraction of the debt God has forgiven us. Now, if you want to know how much exactly should you forgive someone who continues to sin against you, you can read Jesus' response in Matthew 18. But let's just conclude and get real for one more moment. Is there someone in your life that you are knowingly and stubbornly withholding forgiveness from? I didn't ask if there's someone who needs to apologize to you. I'm just asking, is there someone you need to forgive? Now, I could say, you must forgive them. Or I could say the same thing by asking a question. How is it that God has forgiven you? God doesn't need your good works. Your neighbor does. Because we've been forgiven in full for nothing that we've paid, we can forgive our debtors too. Well, I hope you've been strengthened by this message as we've looked at Psalm 51 together, seeing the grace of God in light of the depths of our sin. If you carry great guilt in your life because of sins you've committed, I invite you to find freedom by receiving the forgiveness that God offers in Christ. Now, if you, on the other hand, carry great bitterness because of people sinning against you, I invite you to find freedom in sharing the forgiveness that God has given you in Christ. Let us pray. Father, we thank you again for your word, for its... um, work in our lives just to turn us around, flip us upside down, to totally reshape how we're seeing things. We thank you for your goodness and grace. I mean, no one likes looking at their sin. No one likes going to the doctor or the dentist 
We don't want to know how bad we are. But if we don't look at what your word says about how bad we are, we can never know how good you are. Thank you for showing us your goodness in Christ. Would you work on our hearts tonight? If there's anyone who doesn't know you, God, would you convict them and bring them to faith and repentance? Bring them to nothingness so that you can make them a new creation. And would you strengthen the faith of your people here who feel weary because of their sin? Remind them again of their position in Christ before you, whom you say, look, everyone, this is my beloved child, and I'm well pleased with them because they are in Christ. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.